Hello everyone and good morning! Welcome to Let's Do Research with Dr. S. This is Dr. Sarah Namoko and I am your partner in your research journey. In this video, we shall be learning how to conduct survey research design. The first step in conducting a survey research is to define the problem. Now, my dear friends, it is important that when you define the problem, it should be interesting and important so that you get your respondents motivated to answer the research questions. Now, here is an example. Suppose you would like to say to explore the teacher's view about in-service work. Do you think when you tell your respondents that this is the problem, you, it is enough to get your respondents motivated? Now, how do we correct that? Perhaps you want to say, to obtain a detailed description of primary and secondary teachers' priorities in the provision of in-service education courses. In this way, you are telling your respondents what are the details of your research endeavor. The next step is to identify the population. Population is the group of persons that is the focus of your study. In identifying the population, it must be well defined in sufficient details so that it is very clear as to who is and who is not part of that target population. The next step is to identify or determine the sample. The sample refers to the subjects to be surveyed and they must be randomly selected from the target population. It is important that you as a researcher must ensure that the identified sample possess the desired information and that they are willing to give answer to the research questions. Now, after you have identified your population and your sample, the next step is to choose the data collection methods. Now, there are basic ways of collecting data in survey research. One can be online surveys. It can be web-based or it can be done through emails. Another one is face-to-face -face surveys such as personal interviews or focus group discussions. Another one is telephone surveys, or you can uh, administer a paper survey that is directly administered to a group of people, or you can mail through posts the surveys that you want to conduct. After you have identified the method of data collection that you will employ in your survey research, the next thing that you are going to do is to prepare the research instrument. In survey research, the two most common type of instruments or research instruments used are questionnaire and interview schedule. When you conduct the survey or the interview, it is very important that you ask the same questions to all your respondents and that the conditions in which the questionnaire or interview is conducted should be the same for all the respondents. This time, we are going to discuss about survey questionnaire. When we say, when we say survey questionnaire, these are self-administered by the respondents. Now, when you prepare survey questionnaire, it is important that the appearance of the questionnaire should be attractive, it should be brief, and it should be easily answerable by the respondents. On the other hand, Interview schedule is administered verbally by the researchers. They are the one who ask you questions directly and you give the answers to the questions that are asked to you. So when you conduct an interview, it is important that you avoid unusual words or difficult to understand words. And at the start of the interview, you should define the instructions very clearly or you should define terms that may have different meaning in the context of your study. Now take note, my dear friends, that in both survey and interview, the research instrument must be pre-tested. There are different research instruments in survey research. It can be a structured item such as closed-ended questions or multiple-choice questions. 
It can be unstructured like open-ended questions or you, you will ask your respondents to supply with answers. It can be in a form of scales like Likert scale, hedonic scale, or semantic differential. Or it can be based on rank. What is most important, lesser important, not so important, or first, second, third. Or it can be binary, right or wrong, yes or no, true or false. Or it can be a checklist. Or it can also be in a form of free responses. After you have identified your research questionnaire and after it has been pre-tested or it has been administered to pilot testing, it's time that you prepare the cover letter. Now, what is a cover letter? A cover letter explains what the questionnaire is about and what is its purpose. It should motivate the members of the sample to respond to your survey questionnaire. Now, here is an example of a cover letter. The cover letter should be addressed specifically to the person being asked to respond to the survey. Next, it should be brief. The next characteristics of a cover letter is that it should state the institution where the researcher is affiliated. And then it should also state the importance of a research topic. And it will also state the purpose why the survey is being conducted. In addition, it should engage the respondents to cooperate. It should also indicate the researcher's willingness to share the results of the study once it is completed. Another thing is that the researcher should specify the date by which the completed questionnaire should be returned to the researcher and if it is through a mail survey it is advisable to enclose a stamped self-addressed envelope for the survey for the return of the survey questionnaire next it is very important that you assure your respondents of confidentiality and anonymity anonymity means that no one should be able to trace the respondent to his or her responses provided to you in the survey questionnaire. On the other hand, confidentiality means that the researcher knows who responded to the survey but keeps a promise not to divulge the information about the respondents. You should state the sponsoring institution of some importance that is known to the respondent in case your research is sponsored. Next thing is you should be polite. Do not forget to say thank you. And finally, the survey must be individually signed by the researcher. It should include the contact information of the researcher as well as that of the supervisor. Now, do not be surprised if some of your respondents will not respond to your survey questionnaire or they may sir respond but they will not complete the survey. There are some data that they will miss. It's either by accident or intentional. Okay. If after data collection you will realize that you have a high non-response rate, then uh, this time it is worrisome because your study will lack the generalizability of the results to the population because of the lack of information from the respondents. So how are we going to address non-responses? As presented earlier, there are two types of non-responses. The first one is that your respondents may not return the survey. Accord it is normal, don't worry. According to researches, uh, usually the researcher will receive 30 to 50% response rate during the first mailings. If you send them reminder postcard, you will receive additional 20% response rate. Or if you conduct a second survey with a cover letter politely requesting a response, you may have additional 10% response rate. Now, 
when you do a survey research, it's very important that you determine the response. How do we address for this type of non-response? The first one is use telephone interviews. Suppose you have sent mails, right? And then you have very high non-response rate. So you call your participants, you call your respondents through telephone interviews. And then after you have interviewed a number of respondents, you compare the results of telephone interview with the results of mail survey. Okay, you compare the res their responses and then determine if there is demographic variables. Then you can infer from the results of this comparison. Okay, the second way by which your respondents may not respond is they will not complete the survey. Yes, they will return to you the survey, but they might not complete it either intentionally or they just forgotten to complete the survey. Now, what are the suggested solutions? Number one, when you do the data analysis, you do data clean, cleaning. Okay, you take into account the missing data. And then you understand the reasons for each type of missing data. Is it planned? Is it refusal of the respondents to answer? Or is it non-substantive? When you say plan, say for example, in your survey, you will say, if you are married, proceed to question number 10 and skip questions number 7, 8, and 9. So, the, the missing data is planned from your part, meaning that you planned it right from the start that married, uh, married respondents will not answer questions number 7, 8, and 9. Okay, that is what is meant by plan. Or refusal, meaning that the, res the respondents uh, intentionally refuse to answer your question. Or when you say non-substantive, meaning that uh, the unintentional non-response cannot influence your data analysis later on. Now, after you have identified this, after you have done data cleaning, then you can do missing data analysis. Uh, using SPSS, there are steps there to do when you impute missing data analysis. Now, after you have collected the data and after having uh, computed the response rate, and then you have already determined that the missing data are either planned, refusal, or intentional, and you have already imputed the missing, missing data in your, in your analysis, then it's now time to process the data. If you are using closed-ended questions such as test or a questionnaire, survey questionnaire, then you may use SPSS to analyze the data. But if you are collecting answers to open-ended questions such as in the interviews or focus group discussions then you may analyze the data using thematic analysis now in analyzing the data analysis results you should report the total sample size and the response rate also report the responses for each item the subscale score and the total score now here is an example of a, an analyzed data from the TESDA forum evaluation of 108 webinar participants. Now, when you report, you should, res, uh, you should report the responses for each item and their corresponding description. In this example, for question number one, relevance of topics covered, all 108 participants garnered an average score of 4.94, meaning that 108 participants said that the topics covered is excellent, and so on. Another thing that you are going to report is the subscale score, meaning that it is the average or the mean score of all the items in one subscale. For example, in this, in this example, this one here is one subscale, this one is another subscale, and this one is another subscale. Now, each subscale should have a mean score and a corresponding description. 
And the next thing that you are going to report is the total score, meaning that it is the average or the mean score for all items and it is indicated towards the bottom of your report. To recap, in conducting survey research, the following steps are advised. Number one, define the problem. Number two, identify the population. Number three, determine the sample size. Number four, choose the data collection methods that is appropriate to your study. Number five, uh, prepare the research instrument. Number six, prepare the cover letter. Number seven, collect the data. And number eight, process the data. That would be all. I hope you learned from this video presentation. Now, let me take you to the references which I have used in the preparation of this topic. Thank you very much. Once again, this is Dr. Sara Namoko saying bye-bye. I hope you learned from this video.